Councillor, Minister Sonto, you would take away and perhaps dare I ask a remark on the importance of civil society, as important as it is in, in your own company? Uh, I think the most important uh, message uh, is that um, every country have, has to own their own strategy, but they need to be a part of a global solution and show their cards. And that's very important when every country shall implement the SDGs. Uh, Norway has learned a lot of collaboration with those countries we, we have a, a, a partnership with, with the Climate and Forest Initiative. We have learned a lot to, to see those countries uh, making a greener economy and, and uh, 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 at the same time uh, take care of uh, the forests. So the land uh, restoration is very important uh, as well as the economic growth. And uh, the report uh, from last September, the new climate economy, is also very important to take further on the role of the civil society, the role of the cities, and the role of the private sector. It's uh, so important that we get the public and private partnership to uh, make the progress on the new economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I think for the close. Very quickly to Dion's point, we did not touch on it explicitly today, but I think one of the <coughs> most important frontiers of trying to bring ecosystems in. And I mean, again, Norway's initiative at the time with RED um, was the beginning of not only a results-based financing approach, but also recognizing that there is a value that many benefit from other countries maintaining forests, and why should it not become part of a partnership? I think the work on the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, the fact that our systems of national accounting still very often essentially do not value or record the value of ecosystems and therefore de facto declare them of zero value, which explains why they then you know, get destroyed, is the frontier on which we, we need to, to work more. But I think we are rapidly seeing a shift here. I think in my takeaway, and I would simply say in brackets, civil society has been fundamental to the whole environmental story, uh, to the human rights story, um, and to so many things, I think. And in the SDGs, we saw this rather remarkable, and I think I want to refer here particularly also to the work that UNDP and others in our UN family did, in literally opening up the discussion to millions of people plus the professional engagement of institutions with ideas and concepts that we now find in the SDGs, but also the private sector, progressive private sector being engaged. But there was also a question about, you know, how, how do we make this understandable for, for people out there? And I think this is also my takeaway message. The environmental dimension of sustainable development or the sustainability challenge is one that very often we need expertise in terms of science, environmental professions to understand how they're happening, to articulate a policy reform agenda, but not to mistake that with then wanting to also implement it on behalf of society. I would say 95% of the solutions to our environmental or sustainability challenge lie in the domains of economic policy making, energy policy, justice, uh, human rights, the right to access to clean air. And therefore, sometimes we don't need to talk in the terms of the green economy, which is an analytical a policy framework. We just need to talk about clean air. It's a right of every citizen, or should be. The right to pollute is not. The polluter pays principle is now an established principle. We have legislated, we have policy references. And I think sometimes you just need to take the notion of the green economy out and say, what does it mean to you as a citizen? Just like, actually, the narrative on the green economy in terms of us in the UN beginning to use that term began, oddly enough, in a very narrow corridor 
where the head of the ILO, the head of the International Trade Union Confederation, and the head of UNEP bumped into each other and said, we can't go on having this strange debate about the future of our economies and not address the issue of unemployment decent work. And it was actually the Green Job Study that began nine years or eight years ago, this body of work that came. So jobs, talk about health, talk about unemployment, talk about opportunity, or talk about new markets and access to energy. And let me just end that, you know, I think we are on the verge of having in Paris either the world being able to come together or not. I find it extraordinary that in the year 2015 on a continent with one billion people, one billion African citizens, 700 million of these citizens of that continent have no access to electricity. This is absurd. We talked about the leapfrogging, but let's also accept we are part of the problem in the way that the international system, the aid system, um, the so-called experts in energy have actually sometimes stood in the way of a continent like Africa making this leapfrogging. It's for that reason that the African heads of state adopted this new renewable energy initiative. They are ready to commit, but their choice is very simple. Either you, international community, help us to leapfrog into a 21st century access to energy economy, or we will have no choice but to pick what essentially the market is offering us at a discount, the 20th century energy economy. And those are the terms in which I think we can translate both the SDGs, and some people say 17 goals, nobody will ever understand the 169 goals. Well, you don't have to understand how you know, Steve Jobs designed an iPhone, you just need to know how to use it. And it's the same thing with the green economy in my mind. Thank you.